And now, if your eyes are open, gently close your eyes. We'll do a meditation, a hybrid meditation, Buddhist and Sufi. Gently close your eyes if they're open and then focus on your nostril and simply be present with your breath. As you inhale, and as you exhale, just this much, please. Simply mindful of your in breath and out breath. And please know, this was the Buddha's favorite technique of being present with the breath. And if it helps, silently saying, breathing in, and as you exhale, breathing out. The Sufis say, Allah is the breath within the breath. So I'll be quiet and please be present with the breath within the breath. And if your attention strays away, lovingly, compassionately, please bring it back to your nostril and be mindful of the breath. And now letting go of this, and this time, the Sufi technique, please become aware of your physical heart. Our heart has been yearning, thirsting to connect with us. If it works for you, one hand or both hand on the heart and really enveloping with our consciousness, our heart, feeling our heart and for a few moments really being present, mindful with and off the heartbeat. Connect to the beat of the heart, please. Feel it.
And then with the heart listening to this beautiful revelation that came to the Prophet Muhammad in a dream where God, spirit, divinity says to each one of us, beloved one, I cannot be contained in the space of the earth. I cannot be contained in the space of the heavens, but I can be contained in the space of the pure loving heart of my devotee. Become aware the space of the heart is infinite. Spirit, divinity is outside of you, but also inside of, inside of you, inside our hearts. And now the technique of planting words of beauty into this boundless, limitless space. The Quran says to God belong the most beautiful names. And remember, we become beautiful. Words like, thank you, I am so grateful. I love you. Or please help me to love you. And or please help me. Please help me. I need help. I surrender to you. And or whatever comes to you, plant it in this magical, boundless space again and again and again and again, please. You can never overdo this. I love you with feeling, with sincerity, no matter how awkward it might feel initially. I love you. Or please help me to love you. Thank you. I am so grateful. Please help me. Please help me. I surrender to you. Anything else? Again and again and again. And as you keep saying those words, a most beautiful divine vibration filled with love, healing, empowerment, transformation is going from the tongue into the mouth, into the throat, into the chest, deep into the heart, even deeper into what is called the hidden, and then into the hidden of the hidden astonishingly loving us, blessing us, healing us, empowering us, transforming us. And I'll stop saying anything at all. Just be with your heart for a few moments. I'll do a couple of chants and coming into awareness. The first Buddhist and Sufi. Gate, gate. Paragate, parasamgate, bodhisvaha.
And my friends, ever so gently, taking your time, opening your eyes. And let's collectively do uh, one big ohm. So deep breath. Uh, okay, just a few words. Um, First of all, my association both with Sufism, which is the mystical, spiritual, you might say, core of Islam, the heart of Islam, and Buddhism. Uh, of course, I was born into a Muslim family, but mo most of my S Sufi spiritual insights, they come from my uh, paternal grandfather, who was a rather remarkable healer and teacher and who spent close to 17 years outside of his hometown in Northern India in a religious school called Deoband. It's the second largest Islamic school in the world. The first one is Al-Azhar in Egypt, in Cairo. And the second one is Deoband in Northern India. In those days, in my days of my grandfather, very liberal, very open-minded. Today, of course, there are hundreds of deobans, in fact, thousands of deobans by students who have studied there. And some of them are very, very conservative. And my uh, paternal grandfather, after he finished, after he was away for 17 years, uh, on his way back, he met many, many wandering Sufis and also Hindu mystics. And I'm told we come from a Sufi lineage. So my grandfather, when he came back, he chose to stay in the village. And although he was a, sort of a scholar on Persian, Arabic, and the Quran, but he refused all those offers from, from universities. And he became quite well known as a rainmaker. And that has always fascinated me. He'd be asked by the British government at that time to go on to this parched drought uh, lands where there was no rain and he would ask always for a few days to meditate and go into silence. He had a mosque next to his house and he would spend at least a week there in silence, in prayers, purifying himself. And then on the appointed day, he would uh, go on those particular lands and just just make, put his hands out and pray and mur you know, murmur some words and sometimes nothing happened. And sometimes there'd be a clicking noise and clouds would form and torrential rains would fall. And I'm always fascinated because I see some writings about the exam, they sort of wondered how he did that. And my, my grandfather's hands would go like this and like this, and there was some technique. And he would say he had even no memory of his hands going up or down, but he felt what really connected and sometimes allowed for rain to fall is that it was the sincerity and the increased necessity of the fervor with which he made his prayers. Like Rumi says, oh God, I shall cry to thee and cry to thee and cry to thee until the milk of thy loving kindness boils over. Or as Rumi says, have you not noticed that only when a baby is born, does the mother's chest become filled with milk because there is increased necessity. And for increased necessity to have vibrational power, it has to come from a place of purification, which is why my grandfather, I think, would spend a lot of time in prayer and meditation before doing this particular ritual. So anyhow, so that's my fascination with Sufism and the connection with the invisible world and the visible world. As the Sufis say, there is traffic and trade 
there is traffic and trade in those invisible worlds. Buddhism, um, you know, my parents were diplomats and it just so happened that in some countries they were posted, there was also a diplomat from Thailand at the same level of my father, uh, starting out as a diplomat. And they were posted in similar countries in Saudi Arabia, uh, in Egypt, in Burma, which is a Buddhist country, in, which is now called Myanmar. And his name was Mr. Sumthorn, I remember. And when my father became an ambassador, surprisingly, Mr. Sumthorn from Thailand also became ambassador to the same countries my father was appointed ambassador. It's just, just cosmic, cosmic coincidence, you see. But I say this because he taught the, our entire family so much about Buddhism. He was a very dedicated, devoted uh, Buddhist practitioner. In fact, uh, before he, he's dead now, my parents have also passed away. Uh, when he retired and he became the foreign secretary in Thailand, when he retired, you know, as is the custom, he goes off as a monk by himself and just wanders away in the company of monks, begging for food, being of service to others, and dies away from his family. And what is uh, very touching to me is that he invited both us, the little kids, and my parents before he left on this journey of goodbye uh, as he left his family. So I was very, I was very touched by that. Okay, that's my background. I wanted to, I want to say this because I wanted to ask you when you go into your sharing time, what is your experience of Sufism? What is your experience and connection with Buddhism? Just, just become aware of that. What is your fascination or your interest or your immersion, your slight connection with Buddhism, Sufism, if at all? And don't worry if you don't have any. Okay, so now we get into some uh, content. Uh, I, won't give, I won't give any details, but just some contrasts I will make or some uh, explanation of the life of the Buddha, the life of the Muhammad. By the way, uh, Buddhism was five, six centuries before Christ and Islam is five, six centuries after the birth of Christ just to get a time frame. And if you study the life of the Buddha, by the way, that's not his real name. The, his real name is Gautama Siddhartha. Buddha is just a title. Uh, Buddh means intelligence, like I'm a Bengali, Buddhi in Bengali means uh, intelligence. Uh, so it means someone who is awakened. Like the Buddha was always asked, uh, sir, are you an angel? Uh, are you a wizard? Are you a magician? And what was the answer? He would always say, I am awake. So Buddhism is about awakening. So the Buddha had four passing sites. And just to mention, mention them, and for you to start thinking about in your life, what were or are some or were some passing sights or experiences that led you in the direction of becoming a seeker, more spiritual, that inspired you to ask deeper questions. Like for the Buddha, you know, he was the son of a very uh, powerful, rich prince, some say feudal lord, very protected, was married very young, had a small son actually, and he was so protective, he, he didn't venture too much outside the palace gates, which was a huge area by the way, but with the help of his charioteer uh, named Charaka, he managed to go outside the palace gates and for the first time, or, you know, he became more aware, more conscious of the first one, sight was old age. He saw someone or someone who was really like, you know, really white hair, very old. 
And then his charioteer, Charaka said, uh, my Lord, each one of us will get old. So this is about time. Uh, so what does this mean to you? The, the fact that time does pass on. Well, we all know that, but have I really thought about it? Time passes. Uh, you know, the, da the Daoists have this wonderful verse about when autumn comes, when the season of autumn comes, no leaf is spared because of its beauty, no flower because of its fragrance. My hair will turn white. I will get older. Uh, funny things will happen. My hair will grow in the inside of my ears. I'm just giving you more information than I need to. <laughs> but things just happen. <laughs> Time passes. So I love the mullah stories. Uh, maybe very quickly, I'll mention two of them. Where the mullah is in London Museum, some of you know. And this very famous professor is saying, this is uh, 4,000 years old. Mullah says, excuse me, is 4,004 years old. The guide is annoyed, doesn't say anything. Moves on to the next one. This is uh, 10,000 years old. Excuse me, says the mullah, is 10,004 years old. Happens a third time. This is, you know, 50,000 years old. Excuse me, this is 50,004 years old. So now the guide is quite annoyed, this professor. He's saying, sir, uh, I can see from your turban and your beard, you come from the mysterious East. How can you be so laser precise about those dates? Uh, Mullah says, simple, I was here four years ago. At that time, you mentioned those dates. So what is this about? Has, you know, teaching stories have many levels of meaning. One very important level of meaning is, it's later than you think. So, what can we glean from that? Know that time is really precious. It'll, it'll move faster than you think. Okay, that's one. The other one is the mystery of time. So this other one I will say without saying too much, but um, one, one um, explanation or insight is time is not like you think. We think it's all about cause and effect. What I'm doing today will be the cause of something in the near future or distant future. It could be the other way around. What I'm going to do two years from now will actually be the not the cause but the effect of what's going to happen right now it's 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 a, uh, a very very mysterious concept about time time is not linear it's curved that's why they say uh, everything is part of a larger more mysterious story so here's a story of the bathhouse in those days uh, houses did not have showers or bathtubs uh, so people sometimes would go to public bathhouses so here's a mullah who's a peasant, a poor peasant. He goes into this public bathhouse and the two attendants there, you know, they pay him no attention. He's a poor peasant. You know, what kind of tip will they get from him? No perfume, no soap, a very low class perfume and soap. But as the, masa, the, the, the shower is over, the bath is over, when the mullah leaves, he gives each of those two attendants both a gold coin. And they're astonished. Well, the mullah returns the next month. Of course, they rush to, uh, you know, give him the best massage, the best perfume, uh, the, mess, the best facilities. But as he leaves, he gives each one now a measly copper coin saying, this is for last time. And what I gave you last time is for this time. So just be with that story. It has lots of meaning about time time is mysterious okay so that was just one passing sight old age next one was he saw a person who was really sick suffering and charaka said my lord if we lo live long enough we'll all get sick and suffer well, he was quite shocked, 
quite shocked. So just ask yourself, have I thought about that? It is inevitable. Therefore, it is so important to take care of myself. That's why in Buddhism, the Buddha was asked about, give us some wisdom. And he said, health, contentment, and trust are your greatest possessions. Health, contentment, and trust are your greatest possessions, but your greatest joy is freedom. Health, contentment, and trust are your greatest possessions, and your greatest joy is freedom. And it is quite uh, uh, fascinating that both in the case of the Buddha and the case of Muhammad, uh, they were so gracious uh, when they were sick. You know, uh, the Buddha died when he was 80 years old and towards the end of his life, uh, he was, he was uh, failing in health, but he was invited by a blacksmith named Kunda to his house for lunch. And to his surprise, the, the Buddha accepted his invitation for lunch. And Kunda, for lunch, for him and his disciples, he cooked boar meat, very hard meat. And because the Buddha was so gracious, even though he was in failing health, that's very hard food to digest. He ate it. And after he ate it, as was expected, he fell ill, quite ill. And his disciples were quite angry. That Kunda, couldn't you have fed, you know the Buddha's health was not good, fed him something more healing, more nutritious, yet to cook boar meat for the, for the Buddha. And when, the Buddha, when it, it reached the Buddha's ears, he sent word to Kunda to tell the blacksmith, oh, no, 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 please, Kunda, please, no. Your gift of the boar meat was one, is one of the two most gracious gifts I have ever received in my life. So they said, what, is, what are the two gifts? They said, one gift was when uh, I was meditating under the tree because I was forlorn, nothing, no answers came. And I was there for almost two months. A, a shepherd girl, you know, fed me, fed me and kept me alive. And that is how I've been able to preach in the ministry for 45 years. And the second gift is you have given me this food and now the gates of Nirvana are opening up for me. I'm going to die. And I thank you for that. So the graciousness and the generosity. And Prophet Muhammad, before he died, he would always say uh, to people as he was in the process of dying, have I said anything that hurt you? Please, please tell me because I want to beg forgiveness. Have, do I owe any money to anybody? Please tell me because I want to repay it before I die. And they said, and they said why are you saying all this? You're the prophet. And his famous words were, it is better to blush in this world than in the next world. It is better to blush. It is better to blush in this world than in the next world. So this is all about becoming aware we shall fall sick. And may we continue to be gracious. It's a process. Well, the third sight was actually death. Well, we all know we're going to die, but do we really believe it? Of course we do, but we always think it's going to be later, uh, much later. <laughs> In fact, the Hindus say that if you really believed you could be, you could be dead any time, if you really believed that, you could never hold a grudge against anybody or do anything mean. Meaning, the Hindus say, and we're getting to Hinduism, that we don't quite believe that I'm the one who's going to die soon or any time. It's always the other one who's going to die, not me. So just be aware that 
as the Quran says, every soul, like, let me, yeah, the Quran says, every soul will taste death. So Rumi takes that verse and says, yes, every soul will taste death, but only some of us will taste life. Each soul will taste death, but only some of us will taste life. If you look at the poetry of Hafiz, he says, my greatest regret on my deathbed might be, oh universe, I did not kiss you enough. Oh world, I did not kiss you enough. Just become aware, every soul will taste death, but am I really mindful of that? So what is the lesson from here? One, many lessons. One is, whatever I need to say to someone, I love you, please forgive me, or I want to forgive you, or anything I need to do, don't procrastinate. I know that's very important because I'm a procrastinator. Be present in the now. So what are some of the dying words of the Buddha and Muhammad? It is said that the Buddha, before he died, he, he continued preaching. He said, be a lamp unto yourself. Work out your salvation with diligence. Meaning, till your last breath, continue the process of becoming more Buddha-like, a more complete human being, a better human being, and be of service to God's creation. And the prophet's last words were, please continue doing righteous deeds that will please your sustainer. Do ye righteous deeds that will please your sustainer. So from that we know the, the core of life is about becoming a more complete, developed human being and being of service to God's creation. Okay, the fourth passing sight. The Buddha saw a monk who seemed very unperturbed. Meaning very sympathetic, very compassionate, very loving, but not disturbed by the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations, the, the sorrows and pains and sufferings of life. He had developed what is called the vibration of, in Buddhism it's called equanimity, a sense of inner peace. When things are good, yes, I will laugh and enjoy myself and be happy, but not overly excited. When things are bad, of course I'm sad, I will cry, but I will not become hysterical and depressed and in the dumps. I have developed a sense of equanimity. Like the Buddha says, I'm able to be in the center of the wheel. The wheel goes up, the wheel goes down. That is life, joys and sorrows of life. I'm in the center. I love the story, which I think I said in the previous class, I'll repeat it here, where on a moonlit night, a monk's house is burned to the ground. And all the monk does is look at the moon and says, ah, Finally, a perfect view of the moon at night. That's equanimity, a sense of equanimity. Okay, let me move on now. So those are four passing sites. Old age, sickness, death, equanimity. So what did this do to the Buddha? It Inspired him, inspired him to ask a question that arose from within. It emerged from inside of him. And the question was, why would a mother want to give birth to a child who would grow old, become sick, and die? Why would a mother want to do that? Why would a mother want to give birth to a child 
who would grow old, who would grow sick, and who would die. And this burning question made him go on a search for answers for six to seven years all over India, in the forests of India, everywhere, to find for answers. How, how do you answer this question? So that's the story of the Buddha. So for him, what made him a seeker was a burning question. For you, what was it? It could be a question, could be a life circumstance, could be a series of events, but something turns you in a different direction, inspires you to ask deeper questions. Okay, so in, in, let me quickly go over Muhammad. What does the word Muhammad mean, by the way? Uh, Muhammad means one who is praiseworthy. And it's really about the fact that all of us are praiseworthy. We, you know, we're all Muhammads. The word hamd is praise, uh, meaning there's more to you than you realize. You are your personality, which is nothing more than a bundle of conditioned reactions to life circumstances. But you're also the breath of God, the spirit of Jesus, of Christ, the Buddha nature, Krishna nature, Elohim nature, what is called the divine spark within you which is so worthy of praise. Okay, so what are some passing sights in the life of Muhammad? Well, his story is that when he was born, uh, his father was already dead. And when he was six years old, seven years old, his mother died. So he was an orphan, sh shunted from household to household. So. In the Quran, if you read the Quran, the life of Prophet Muhammad, he had a very soft corner for orphans. One of his famous sayings is, when an orphan cries, the throne of God shakes. So it's about really caring for those who are not protected, those who are marginalized. The Buddhists would say, yes, have compassion have empathy, have lo loving kindness for those who are suffering. Then the second passing site with uh, the Prophet Muhammad noticed in the society, he was born in the seventh century uh, Arabian Peninsula. He saw the mistreatment of slaves. And that became a big issue in his life that we have to treat slaves like human beings we have to free them and he would speak out against the mistreatment of slaves of course this is really about metaphorically in our lives, in, in contemporary times, um, how do I treat those who offer me no material advantage? That's a good litmus test of a human being. How do I treat those over whom I have power? That's a good litmus test of who I am and who others are. And also, if you want to get even more metaphorical, What am I a slave to? Like in Sufism, there's a lot of talk about I've become a slave to my ego rather than a slave to divinity. I have to free myself from the slavery of the ego. That's why in Sufism, the main work or one, a primary work is transforming the ego from a commanding master into a personal assistant. In Buddhism, they will say, you have to free yourself again from the ego, from the desires of the ego. Because our desires can never be fulfilled. All the traditions say that. In Islam, they say, if you give someone 
two valleys of gold, he or she will still yearn for a third. The Buddha said, this is a story of my life, of anybody's life. The words are like a hunted hare or rabbit, like a hunted hare, you run. Like a hunted hare, you run from life to life. The pursuer of desire pursued. Like a hunted rabbit here, you run from life to life. The pursuer of desire pursued, harried from life to life. Okay, quickly moving on. A third sight which really disturbed the Prophet Muhammad was the mistreatment of women. Uh, for those of you who are not Muslims, not knowing the intimate life of Prophet Muhammad, uh, women loved the Prophet Muhammad because he was a champion. He was a, he's considered the most radical feminist. So in his time, it was unthinkable. He granted women uh, through the Quran property rights, divorce rights, inheritance rights, which is actually unthinkable even today in, in, some, in some Muslim societies. He married several times, which is, was the custom at that time to have more than one wife, but he actually was married to one woman for 25 years till she died, and who was also 15 years older than him, going against every cultural norm. Being married to just one woman, which was considered most unmanly in those days, seventh century, and married to her for 25 years till she died, and who was 15 years her senior. And then after she died, he married several times, except for one who's a daughter of his best friend who insisted he marry her because if you want to accept me in your family, if you say we're such close friends, please marry my daughter. That was Aisha. But all the other ones, the other seven wives he had, they were either all slaves, widows, or divorcees, considered discards in that community. And he was letting people know, if I, as a prophet, I am marrying a widow, a slave, or a divorcee, please, you do the same. Respect that person. And don't disrespect only because what you consider the cultural norms of the society. Okay, the fourth site that Prophet Muhammad saw and David disturbed him was tribalism. All these tribes fighting one another. Just as the Buddha, he rebelled against the Hindu caste system, which was not religious but it had become religious through cultural norms. When we study, if you study Buddhism with me, you, you'll know that there is the, the, the priestly caste, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, they could not intermarry, and you were just born into that. So the children of Brahmins were always Brahmins, but the children of Sudras, that's the lowest caste, hierarchy in the caste were always sudras. And the Buddha said, this is not just. And by the way, this is not part of the religion of Buddhism, but they made it a part of the religion through, you know, through cultural norms. In, in, in the case of Muhammad, he was against all this polarization, which is why you have in Islam these sayings like, please share three cups of tea with the other who is different. Listen, respect, connect. Okay, just be with what I've said so far and know that both in the case of the Buddha and the case of Muhammad, for the Buddha, it was the question, why would a mother want to give birth to a child who would grow old, who would become sick and who would die? In the case of Muhammad, oh God, why do you allow this? So much of so many orphans, uh, slaves, women who are being oppressed, so much of this killing between the tribes. Why do you allow this? 
So let me take the case of the Buddha, when after six or seven years of searching for answers, he met many, many, many wise sages, but was never satisfied with the answers. Finally, he sat down under this tree, which still exists in India, called the Bodhi tree, I mean the wisdom tree. The tree is still there uh, in India. He sat under the tree saying, I will not rise from this tree until the answers come from within. So basically he sat in silence. The Prophet Muhammad, he was so much in despair, he'd go in the mountains and just sit in silence. When the Buddha sat under this tree saying, I will not leave this tree and I will die here until the answers come to me. Finally, we don't know the exact uh, time, but some say on the 49th day, some say much later. And he had all kinds of visions, they say, of temptations. They had uh, the goddess of Kama, that's the goddess of desire. Then the goddess of the gods of Mara, destruction. You know, uh, he saw, you know, flaming stones, hurricanes, uh, earthquakes. But he just sat there in silence. And finally, by sitting in silence, answers came. He connected with what is called the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And that is the core of Buddhism. Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. If you follow those, you will become freed, emancipated. In the case of Muhammad, he used to go for meditations in the caves and one particular night in the year 610 CE, he had this phenomenal night of power where angel Gabriel came and in this encounter, the first verses of the Quran were revealed to the prophet Muhammad. So the Quran has its roots in the womb of silence. So here, just for a few seconds, just be with that, that both in the case of the Buddha, in the case of Muhammad, they both went into deep silence. I'm repeating the word silence again and again, just to emphasize the majesty, the beauty, the power of silence. And before we take a break, I just want to tell you what Rumi has said about silence. I hope some of you know it by heart. Uh, Rumi says, please ponder on this. Silence is not the absence of sound. It is the absence of the little self. Silence is not the absence of sound. It is the absence of the little self. He goes on to say, silence is the language of God Everything else is a poor translation. He goes on to say, please, please, please be silent, be silent, so that the Lord who gave you language may speak. For as he fashioned a door and a lock, he also made a key. The Buddha has always said, be in silence. It is said that one of his statements is, uh, not exactly in these words, but somebody asked the, the Buddha, what do you gain in meditation? And the Buddha apparently said, nothing at all. And this shocked the disciples. Then the Buddha said, let me tell you what I have lost in silence, in meditation. I have lost my anxiety, my depression, my fear of death, fear of old age, that is why I practice silence. Also, if you look at the life of Muhammad and Buddha, the Muhammad would spend, particularly early in his ministry, hours and hours meditating in the caves. You look at the life of the Buddha. 
after he became enlightened and he began preaching for 45 years, every year, even though he was so, he was one of the most busy human beings on the planet. People had questions for him. He would preach everywhere he went. But in the rainy season, he would take three months off in silence, be in silence. So out of one year, three months silence. Every day, he would meditate at least three times. In his entire life, he was 80 years old when he died. He took six years off to explore and spent 45 years in his ministry. This is called withdrawal and return. In Islam, it's called, uh, Rumi says, we're like a fish out of water, thrashing and quivering on the banks. From time to time, we need to enter into those nourishing waters of silence. Okay, my friends, I have said enough. Just be with that for a few moments. We'll take a break. And after the break, I will ask, ask you to focus on these questions we have written down here. I think Sally Jo will has them on the chat or she'll put it on the chat. Um, one is share your experiences or knowledge of Buddhism and Sufism. What has been your knowledge or experience or not, maybe none at all about Sufism and Buddhism? What has been your experience? Another question is, what is your experience regarding silence? Just silence. How do you weave it in into your life as an example? And the fourth question is, uh, when did you first become aware of other people's suffering? I mean, in a palpable way. As Sufis say, when did you move from a knowledge of the tongue to a knowledge of the heart about other people's sufferings? So let's take a break for 10 minutes and we come back, we'll get into groups and answer those questions. And I believe, I'm sure Sally Joe has it up there. There it is, yeah. So just look at those questions. Share your experiences or knowledge of Buddhism and Sufism. Uh, what is your experience of silence? How do you weave it into your life? When did you first become aware of other people's suffering? When did you move from a knowledge of the tongue to knowledge of the heart for suffering? 